4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a hotel receptionist and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Sunset Hotel. How may I help you? Good morning. I just saw an advert in the paper about your hotel. Where exactly is it located? We are situated on Sunset Avenue, north of the beach close to many scenic spots. It is an ideal choice for travellers interested in sightseeing. That's great. Is there a vacant four-bed room? We'll be travelling with our two sons, aged 9 and 11, so it's best that we are able to stay in one room. Let me check. Just a moment. Um, we only have a few four-bed rooms, and I'm afraid they are fully booked at the moment. The earliest time available is August. But there might be some left in July if a previous customer cancels the reservation. Oh, that'll do. How much would the room cost me? It's €77.50 Euros 50 during peak time, but the price would be much lower during off-peak season. Only €50. Euros. So, if I book a room right now, is there any discount? Yes, we do offer a 30% discount for any reservation made one month ahead of schedule. It is a very reasonable price. That does sound tempting. Does the price include anything? The price includes two breakfast vouchers per room per day. You can use them at two different restaurants in our hotel. There's also a 20-minute spa trial available, but you have to book it beforehand at the concierge or directly at the spa centre. Um, I'm wondering if there is a hairdryer in the room. It takes ages to dry my hair without one. Do I have to bring one? No, there is absolutely no need to bring that, for each room is equipped with a hairdryer. But I have to inform you that towels are not provided. You'll have to bring your own, or hire some at the front desk. Oh, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Before making a reservation, can you tell me a little bit more about your hotel? Sure, no problem. We aim to please our guests by providing impeccable service at all the modern amenities, trying to make them feel at home. In the lounge, there are a list of books, ranging from contemporary literature to classic poetry, Free for any guest to read, there is also a games room offering a number of indoor games, including popular board games like Monopoly, as well as the beloved Table Soccer. A nice place to go on rainy days. Are the computers available in the hotel? I might have a few emails to respond to during my stay there. I'm afraid we currently do not provide any for our customers. However, internet is available within our hotel premises. Just use the room number and the guest name to log in. That means I have to bring my own laptop then. All right. Um, because I'm travelling with my two sons, is there anything that they might be interested in? Yes. A popular activity here for children is collecting shells on the beach. Our hotel has a private beach. When there are very few visitors, you can take a stroll down the beach with your children and enjoy some quality family time undisturbed. That sounds nice. But you see, my boys really love adventure. 
Is there something more exciting for them to participate in? We do have bicycles ready for hire. You can cycle with the boys along the bush track by the hotel, which is an ideal place to explore the wonders of nature. But because there is only a limited number of bicycles, we apply a first come, first served rule. Got it. I think my boys would love it. How can I arrange the payment then? Can I pay by credit card? Of course. We take credit cards. Thank you. You've been a great help. My pleasure, ma'am. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear Jim and Jane, two students, talking about their professor's lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Jane, what did you think of Professor Morgan's lecture? I don't know about you, but I find it incredibly difficult to believe that light influences the environment as much as he says. I've never seen any journal articles, websites or anything that verifies his arguments. It's stupid. On the contrary. I've seen a great deal of research supporting his argument from a wide range of renowned scientists. Have you looked at the recommended textbook listed on the course outline given to us at the beginning of the semester? All the information is in there. Perhaps you've just been looking in the wrong places. I never look at the course outlines. I have so many loose sheets of paper I tend to lose anything I'm given by the end of the day. What's the textbook they recommend? And where can I get it from? I should probably go buy it soon. I'm already behind in the course. Yeah, you definitely should buy it. And our grades are more important this year. It's called The Influence of Light on the Environment. You should be able to find it in the bookshop on campus. If not, they'll order it within two weeks. In the meantime, you should read up on Ken Simpson's work. He argues that in order to protect natural habitats, governments should endeavour to turn off lights in cities at night. Well, that's controversial. I doubt any government would be willing to do that any time soon. I imagine roads would become quite dangerous without street lighting. For this issue, Dave Kepler suggests they could just replace the existing lights with more environmentally friendly bulbs. They could even install solar-powered lights. That way, roads will be more eco-friendly while maintaining safety. Although I guess they wouldn't be particularly effective in colder countries, especially during the winter. That's quite a good idea, actually. The price of solar power is supposed to be on par with electricity within the next few decades. And it was on the news this morning. I've also heard that, according to Sharon Gray, in countries with more sunlight, insect-eating animals tend to be smaller in size. Since there are fewer insects, and the remaining insects produced a smaller number of eggs. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that sunlight also has a negative effect on the quality of water. But I'm not sure I believe it. In many hot countries, particularly developing countries, there is a lot of water pollution caused by factories rather than sunlight. Nevertheless, Maria Jackson says that in direct sunlight, 
the surface of the water becomes more translucent. Therefore, it affects the amount of sunlight that aquatic insects can absorb. Not much research has been undertaken to prove Jackson's theory, but it seems to have been widely accepted anyway. I've never heard of that. I'll have to look it up on Google. The only other theory I've studied is Barbara Swallow's study on how declined insect population adversely affects the frog population. Not that I'm complaining. I hate insects, especially spiders. You have arachnophobia? I never would have guessed. Didn't your brother have a pet black widow spider? Yes, he did, and I hated it. It escaped from its cage once, and we never found it. I had nightmares for months. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. OK, now I'm getting goosebumps. Let's change the subject. What's your stance on natural and artificial light? Honestly, I'm not sure it makes much difference which one you use. Species will die out either way. I think the real argument we should consider is global warming and protection or replacement of finite fuels. Solar power provides us with an incredible opportunity to replace electricity, and governments should definitely increase spending on research in this field. The theories discussed in our lectures, like Simpsons and Greys, are so vague and lack proof, so I don't understand why we even study them. I see what you mean. I don't like learning unsupported theories for exams, and I'd rather spend my time learning something else. For example, I'd be much more interested in studying the animals in safari parks than researching migratory birds, particularly the effect of tourists on the quality of life of animals. As we know, every year thousands of visitors will drive in their own vehicles or ride in vehicles provided by the facility to observe freely roaming animals. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Especially those animals living in more tropical countries like Borneo. Following on from that, I want to study how bringing animals over from foreign countries to put in our zoos affects their life expectancy. For example, do you remember when China sent pandas to Edinburgh Zoo? Apparently, one of the pandas became depressed but it was never explained why. To me, obviously, you can't take an animal out of its natural habitat and put it in a cage on the other side of the world. It just doesn't work. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You're going to hear a presentation about the student union given during university orientation week. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, the student union here is really the heart of campus life. There are many different services, and most of the student groups and organizations meet at this facility. As a student at the university, you have full access to all that we offer. I guess I will talk about the dining facilities first. We have eight venues from which students can choose to have their meals. Two of these are franchise outlets that offer normal fast food fare, such as fish and chips, hamburgers, and soda. One dining area has a do-it-yourself system. Specializing in food for the vegetarian and vegan members of the campus community, there is a wide selection of vegetables, fruits, and grains. At the end of the buffet are several cooking stations available for students to create their own meals. The student union has a wide variety of entertainment options as well. Those over the minimum age can drink at one of the three bars. During the school year, they regularly offer live music, musical groups from both the local scene and occasionally even very famous people have performed there. All the bars serve domestic and imported beers, wine, and hard liquor. A cinema theater with 750 seats is available for screening films. The Movie Appreciation Group also screens many types of films, even foreign and classic movies. Also, the theater is where guest speakers hold lectures. These speakers are sometimes professors from other universities or other notable people. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now I want to explain how to go about reserving a space in the student union for your event. We have several different types of rooms, ranging from small gathering areas to large lecture halls. Students can also show a movie or documentary at the cinema theater. Any student organization that wants to hold an event or meeting must submit a form available at the information desk in the main hall. On this form, you must provide a name, their contact information, a short description of the event, the type of room required, and the time and date you need it. Any organization sponsoring the event or meeting must also be listed, along with the budget. This budget has to include items bought for the event and any people who are hired. There is also a section for any sort of multimedia resources you need. Write down anything you might need, such as speakers, projectors, screens, microphones, podiums, or even computers. We will contact the Media Resources Center to make sure all the necessary equipment is there at the right time. We are always looking for ways to improve the student union. If there is any part of the building that needs service, please inform the person at the information desk. There is also a suggestion box at the desk where you can fill out a card and give us more ideas for improvements. We have about 1,500 people working here for the community and we're open to anything that can make your university life more enjoyable and productive. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a conversation about astronomy. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 
to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. This is Magic Time from the BBC. I am Faith. In today's programme we invite a Professor of Astronomy. Welcome Lewis. Thanks a lot Faith. What magic information will you introduce to us? We all know the Leonidists in August are coming. So today, let's talk about meteors. Good topic. At one time or another, almost everyone has glimpsed a swift little streak of light dashing across the night sky. Nearly everyone makes wishes when they see them and blame both good and bad luck on their presence. Yes, these sudden celestial visitors are meteors. We often call it shooting star. The glowing trails are caused by the incineration of a piece of celestial debris entering our atmosphere. Many meteors are quick flashes, but some last long enough for us to track their brief course across the sky. Right. Now and then, a meteor truly will light up the night, blazing brighter than Venus, although rarely, even brighter than the moon, leaving in its wake a dimly glowing trail that may persist for minutes. Lewis. Can we see some meteors every night in one year? Yes. Under a dark sky, any observer can expect to see between two and seven meteors each hour any night of the year. These are sporadic meteors. Sporadic meteors? Yes. Their source bodies, meteorids, are part of the dusty background of the inner solar system. Several times during the year, Earth encounters swarms of small particles that greatly increase the number of meteors. The result is a meteor shower, during which observers may see dozens of meteors every hour. Concentrations of material within the swarms may produce better than average displays in some years, with rates of hundreds per hour, and were treated to a truly amazing display in which thousands of visible meteors can be seen for a brief period. The phenomenon is called meteor storms, which are more magnificent than meteor showers. Aha! That's wonderful! Definitely. The meteors that appear during a meteor shower seem to come from one point in the sky. This illusion is an effect of perspective, just as a roadway seems to converge in the distance. Usually, meteor showers get the name of the constellation from which the meteors appear to radiate. Such as during the Perseid shower in August, meteors seem to streak from a point in the constellation Perseus. When is the biggest meteor storm? According to records, in 1833, a storm of 60,000 meteors an hour shocked the world. 60,000? That's unbelievable! By the 1860s, scientists had known that many meteor showers were annual, including the normally placid Leonids which produced the big storm, and that they were somehow related to comets. Really? Yes, but most of the meteors people have seen during one of the annual showers arise from fluffy particles not much larger than sand grains. As a particle enters Earth's atmosphere, it collides with gas atoms and molecules. The particle becomes wrapped in a glowing sheaf of heated air and vaporized material boiled off its own surface. Whether meteor is very near to us when it appears? No, in fact, it is an illusion. However, even well-trained professionals can be fooled, such as airline pilots have swerved to avoid meteors that were actually 160 kilometers away. A meteor that appears brighter than any of the stars and planets is a fireball. Fireball? That's so interesting. Yeah. 
Most meteors are seen 80 to 120 kilometers above the ground. Sometimes someone will claim to see a fireball land on a hilltop, but in fact, a real fireball first appears at a height of about 125 kilometers, and loses its brightness while still at least 20 kilometers above the ground. Yes. What colors do meteors have? Usually, most meteors look white, but some also appear blue. Green, yellow, orange, or even red. What will happen if a meteoroid gets to the surface of the Earth without being completely vaporized? It will be a meteorite. I heard meteorites were long ago thought to be cast down as gifts from angels. Yes, and others thought the gods were displaying their anger. Really? As late as the 17th century, many believed they fell from thunderstorms. They were nicknamed thunderstones. Many scientists didn't believe the accounts of people who claimed to have seen meteors, and some experts were skeptical that stones could fall from the clouds or the heaven. Yes. One of the most significant meteorite events in recent history destroyed hundreds of square miles of forest in Siberia on June the thirtieth, nineteen o eight, according to local witnesses. A ball of fire streaked through the sky, and seemed to enter the atmosphere at an oblique angle. It exploded, sending out hot winds and loud noises, and shaking the ground enough to break windows in nearby villages. Small particles blown into the atmosphere lit the night sky for several days. So nowadays, the prevailing theory holds that a meteor exploded just above the surface. Yes. Most impact craters and basins larger than the meteor crater are heavily worn away, or have been buried by rocks and dirt as the Earth's surface changed. At present, Chicxulub Basin, centered in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, is the largest one. The diameter of basin is around 300 kilometers. Rock samples obtained by drilling into the basin. Show that an asteroid struck the Earth there about 65 million years ago. Does that the same period with the dinosaurs disappeared? That's right. Many scientists believe this debris caused climate changes, which made the dinosaurs not survive. We do really hope that will never happen again. Right. Okay. Thanks for watching today's program. See you next week. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.